Okay, let's roll. All right. Well, today is September the 7th. Is that right? Okay, October the 7th. Excuse me, September the 7th. October the 7th will be here soon enough. And we'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and during that time we have the opportunity to name privately to God any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of your grace that we are being able to be here and we don't have to hide. We don't have to uh, be clandestine in worshiping you. We thank you for that. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate as we learn your word and are ready to apply it to our circumstances. We thank you for that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anybody remember last Thursday on our Romans study what the topic was? What were we talking about? Don't. <laughs> Vicissitudes of life? <laughs> well, I figured that word would be remembered maybe. Vicissitudes just mean changes. Sometimes uh, changes that are not expected. They can be good or bad, but most of the time they're bad. I want to do, uh, well, just so you'll know, the topic uh, for the overall message was hope. Remember that? Let me get up here where the verse is Romans chapter 4, 18. You can turn to that if you'd like. We're still talking about Abraham, or at least Paul is, so we're following Paul, so we're looking at Abraham. I'll put this up on the board for you. Here we are. In Romans chapter 4, 18, talking about Abraham, and it says, in hope against hope, he believed, in order that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. So this is the promise that is going to carry on all the way to verse 23 or 24, talking about this very issue. Of course, we know that Abraham was sexually dead and that his wife, Sarah, was barren. Her whole life was barren. He was 100 years old, and she was 90 years old, so the prospects of them having a child was nil. It was impossible for them to have a child. And that's why it starts out saying, in hope against hope, he, Abraham, believed. I mean, in human terms, that would be, Asinine to think that someone could have a child at that time. And yet, he went beyond hope in order that he might become the father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. And who was doing the speaking? It was God. What was he saying? He was saying that you're going to have a child, you're going to have a son, and his descendants will be as numerous as the stars, and kings and nations are going to come from him. But more importantly, the entire world was going to be blessed through Abraham because there was one with a capital O that would come that would bless the entire world by taking care of the world's sin problem, and that was none other than Jesus Christ. So here we have the beginning of this hope. And we went, I have a lot of notes that we went over here on um, notes. I'm not going to go over them because we have a lot to cover already tonight. Uh, I will start here and go over a few verses here. Faith comes first, which then produces hope. You cannot have hope apart from faith. The faith comes first. Example, we believe the gospel which, which gives us hope, which is confident expectation 
that we have eternal life and that we will not go to the lake of fire. That's the two main things that comes to mind whenever we have faith in Jesus Christ. We trust in Him. We call it faith alone in Christ alone. And when that occurs, then we have confident expectation, which is called hope, that we have eternal life and that we will not go to the lake of fire. That's the two main things that people are dealing with. Are they going to go to hell? Most people don't know about the lake of fire, Gehenna, or any of those type of things, but that's essentially where they do not want to go, and they do hope that they have eternal life, and that all actually is facilitated by faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Those who have no hope, excuse me, those who have no faith have no hope and will spend eternity in the lake of fire. Unfortunately, here's a few verses we went over. Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You see that? Joy and peace comes from believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't just gin up hope in your soul by your own power. That's not how it happens. What you do is get some information about God. We call it doctrine or biblical principles and precepts. Once you get that into your soul and you believe those, you believe those things, then you receive joy and peace in believing it. All these things are there for the taking for those who believe it. Most people do not. That's kind of hard to fathom, isn't it? The phenomenal things that God has for us, which are free, based upon his promises where he cannot lie, and you give these promises to people and they reject them. That that's just shows the, I guess you could say, the depravity of man. But you can't gin up this hope by your own power. You have this joy and peace by the power of the Holy Spirit because he gives you divine viewpoint, the thinking that results in joy and peace. And it is all related to God and his grace. That's what this life is all about, God and his grace. And are you going to accept it? Are you going to do something with it? Or are you just going to say, well, I don't have to be, I don't have to be under God. I'm just going to go my own way. Well, go ahead. You'll wind up in the lake of fire. But if you're listening to this, you won't have any excuse as to say, well, I didn't know that was going to happen. It absolutely will. We're going to skip through this. Here's another. Psalm 38, 15. For I hope in thee, O Lord, thou wilt answer, O Lord, my God. Of course he'll answer. He's the God of hope. What do you do when life totally falls in on you with no money, no car, no place to live, and no way to care for her little boy? This was a little thing. I'll just do this one. Tiffany Torbib, Tor, uh, Tor, Torbio chose the dark path. She placed her hand over the three-year-old son's mouth, suffocated him twice because she had no money, she had no place to live, she, she'd had no one to care for her. She was going to kill her little boy, suffocating him, but he goes on to say the first time she performed CPR to restore his breathing, then suffocated him a second time. That is a tortured soul that would do such a thing. But that where, that's where you can be driven to if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, if you have no hope, that was the whole point. She had no hope. She was desperate. She buried him in the background, excuse me, playground sand and left. No one would believe you if you made this, this story up. It shows the evil that comes from hopelessness. Tiffany, having no place to turn, chose the wrong path and little Tyrus paid with his life. When life is hopeless, we can turn to the Lord, always. Okay, let's get down here where we're starting tonight. This is lesson 119, and we go on with verse 19. 
Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Plowing new ground now. And without becoming weak in faith, he, Abraham, contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So Abraham knew full well that what God said he was going to do was absolutely impossible. It would take a miracle for this to happen. And what Abraham is going to find out that miracles are nothing for God to produce. No, no big deal. It's the things that he does that has to deal with our volition that are much harder. Now, nothing is hard for God, but in our mentality, we think God is not limited in producing a miracle because it does not depend on man's volition. But to be able to save man from his own sins and the depraved state that he is in with the volition coming into play, those are the things that at least in our mind are much harder for God to deal with. A miracle, he can just snap his hand, snap his fingers, and it's no big deal. But look at this. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated, thought about his own body, now as good as dead, 100 years old, and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So, Abraham came a long way from the time the Lord first promised him that he would bear a son and nations and kings would come from him. He certainly was weak in faith then. So when we're looking at this verse, it's not talking about when Abraham first heard this. It's talking about much later, after he'd gone through, time had passed, about 25 years, and he'd gone through all these testing and tribulations. Then he became where he was not weak in faith and this is how he started in Genesis chapter 17, verse 16 through 18. Now, we, isn't it nice that we have studied Abraham and Genesis? We're in chapter 42, and this happened in Genesis 17. I know it was a long time ago in our minds, but we did go over this, and that means that we're not completely bereft of knowledge regarding these issues. So Genesis 17, 16, this is God speaking, and I will bless her, talking about Sarah, and indeed I will give you a son by her, then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of peoples shall come from her. And of course, and Abraham, because of course Abraham fathered the son. Verse 17, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. This is a despicable thing. Can you imagine? Look at this. What a jerk. God made a phenomenal promise to Abraham, and he laughs and suggests that his son Ishmael may be the heir before God. Now, have you ever thought about what you would do if you were God in these situations? I think about it all the time. I think about, well, if Abraham did that to me and I was God, that would be the end of Abraham. God gives, he loves Abraham to the nth degree and he gives him phenomenal promise. The very thing that he wanted the most was a son, he wanted an heir, and God promises that he's going to have it. And Abraham laughs. Now he didn't laugh out loud, but God knew that he left, uh, laughed. Sarah did the same thing. When Jesus Christ came with a couple of angels to visit them, and Abraham was out there, and you know, Sarah was over at the door like this, I guess, because Jesus Christ even said then that he was going to have an heir, and what did she do? She laughed. Only she didn't laugh outside. But when she laughed, Jesus said, why does Sarah laugh? And what did Sarah do? What would you do? She lied. I didn't laugh because it wasn't audible, see. But Jesus knows what we think. 
He said, oh, yes, you did. You laughed. I mean, did, laughing can be the most cruel thing that a person can do is laugh at somebody, especially in a very, uh, I guess you would say, wonderful promise that has been given here, and they're going to laugh? And this is God they're laughing at? So he suggests that Ishmael be the heir of God. Right after God said, no, you're going to have an heir from Sarah. Uh, what an insult this was to God, and yet his promise would still be fulfilled, not because Abraham was faithful. He was sometimes, but a lot of time, maybe even most of the time, he was not. So he was God wasn't faithful and still went through and produced an heir because of Abraham and his faithfulness, but because of God and his infinite faithfulness to all of his promises. It is impossible for God to make a promise and not carry it out. And it was received in this manner? So when we're looking up here at this verse, and it says, and talking about Abraham, and without being weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. And then it's going to go on. And what it says that he wasn't weak in faith, and the next verse is going to say he was strengthened in faith. Well, that didn't happen from the very beginning. We just I just showed you what happened the first time they heard this. Romans 4.20, that was verse 19. This is Romans 4.20. Yet respect to the promise of God, he, Abraham, did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. So we can read between the lines since we know what he said and what Sarah said and how they both laughed when they heard the truth, mocking God. How, what an insult. But we know that was at the beginning and what, he, what Paul is referring to here is at the end. A lot of water went on the bridge between the first time they heard this promise and the time that they heard the promise again, and they did not falter. He, did not, he, didn't, he was not weak in faith. Verse 20 says, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Something happened from the first time they heard it to the time that you have the apostle Paul giving this which is completely different than how they started. So why did Abraham not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith? What happened? Well, he had to go through many trials and tribulations before faith was strengthened by witnessing the faithfulness of God in every situation. That's what happens over time. You don't come up, become a believer and the next day or the next week or the next month, oh, you're ready to fight the elephants. You, you're not even spiritually prepared to fight a cockroach. Things have to happen. It takes time for this faith to develop and be strong. And the way that God brings that strength in faith is through trials and tribulations, puts you in a no no uh, impossible situation that you can do anything about, and then he shows you by your faith in him that he is always going to come through. He will never let you down, and that takes ex ex experience to see God's, wit uh, God's faithfulness. Our faith is strengthened not only by learning God's word, but also applying it to our circumstances and personally witnessing the faithfulness of God. And I underline the word there, personally. You can hear about other people and say, oh, I was, I was just in a desperate situation. I had nowhere to go. It was hopeless. And I prayed to the Lord and he answered my prayer. And that person is explaining to you they have personally witnessed in real time, God's faithfulness. And that's how we develop it, is through 
trials and tribulations. Now, none of us want to go there. But by now, I've been harping on this long enough to where hopefully whenever something happens that is very unpleasant, that it might be life-changing, that you can take it in stride because you know God is trying to demonstrate to you in this no solution problem that he is the solution. And when you are humble and, he, and you ask him for help, he every time will come through. Every time. Because is, he is utterly faithful. That's how we go from weak faith to being strengthened in our faith. You might say, well, I wish there was another way. I do too. But this is God's way, and it works. And here's, th there's really one good note in here that is, should be somewhat um, somewhat uh, a, a good note in this, and that is we don't have to choose when or how these trials and tribulations are going to come. Can you imagine God saying, okay, now you're a believer now, and you're going to need to be tested and tried, so I want you to give me an outline by next week of how you want to be tested and what you're going to be tried. Can you imagine what that would be like? <laughs> that might be a test in itself. I relay that to death as well. I'm so thankful that God made it to where we can't make a, set the date of our death. For one thing, we'd be oh so fossilized we couldn't even get around. <laughs> so our faith is strengthened not only by learning God's word, but also applying it to our circumstances. Look at this. And personally witnessing the faithfulness of God. If you haven't personally witnessed that, you are missing out. The failure to apply doctrine is like studying your entire life to take an exam, but never showing up to take the test. What's the point? Why study for a test your whole life? And you have poured yourself into this. You know all the answers. And yet you're too afraid to go and take the exam. That's why God doesn't give us a choice. We are examined and tested by God, and it's through His schedule and through His means. It is for our blessing and His glorification. To really be good at something, you have to have hands-on experience. Learning from a book or a teacher is fine, but you learn more by putting what you have learned into practice in real-time experience. I'll give you an example. I can't believe I still remember this man's name after about 55 to 60 years ago. His name was Ben Roth. He was a little old fella. I was probably 18, 19. And, I, you know, I towered over him. He was a plumber, and I was his plumber apprentice. And he was going to train me. And I can remember. <laughs> that he might have been small in stature, but he was big in, in the way he held himself and the way uh, and the values that he had. So they said, this is a. Uh, Mr. Roth, you're going to be his assistant. I said, okay. And so he said, follow me. And we went out onto the, the construction job. And there was a place where we were going to be working. And the first thing he did, he found this big old uh, jar that had I don't know what in it. And he threw it, it was glass. And he threw it and broke it right there in the middle of the thing. Boy, did he get my attention. I didn't know, was he mad or what? All right, boy, your first job is to clean this mess up. It wasn't just that. I mean, he, he wanted a clean working place. I didn't say anything. I got busy and cleaned it up. And I remember he was uh, teaching me how to solder because this we had the water lines were made out of copper, and you had to solder them together. That's how they were done. And so 
he had a, a pipe, I think probably three quarter inch copper pipe, and he had an L on it. And <clears throat> he says, Okay, come here, boy. Yes, sir. Solder that joint. Okay. And I, I, I didn't have a clue what to do. And so I put, <laughs> I just uh, took an L and put it on the end of a copper pipe and one in the top. Boy, what's the matter with you? Don't you know anything? I said, I don't know this. So get out of the way. And he took some sand cloth and he would clean the copper uh, where the joint was going to be on the pipe and inside the L. He says, okay, you have to do this first. I said, okay. And I started to put them together. Go, no, no, what are you doing? I don't know. You got to put flux on that. You got to put, and then he would show me how to do it. I was scared. I didn't know what to do now. So I put them together. I said, okay. He said, well, get with it. <laughs> so I had seen people use a torch on it, see? And so I put it heat on it. And the, 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 uh, it's actually lead and silver combined that you solder with. And I, for, I didn't know, I thought maybe it just come together with the heat. So he went and got the, the solder. <clears throat> and he said, okay, now do it. You got to put the heat on first. So I was heating it. And he showed me how to take, when it gets to a certain temperature, hot enough to melt that solder, it runs into the, joint. And so I did that, and I want to make sure there was enough so it was dripping solder out, because I did, I would hate for that to leak. I don't I, I know what would happen. I'd probably be run out of town. So he said, get out of the way. And he said, I said, well, what did I do wrong? He said, <clears throat> when you see a drip of solder come out of that, it's not going to take any more. He said, and you're using up good solder right here. Drip, 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 drip. It's not going to get any more. Now, that's the way he was. But you know, it, it, it sounds like he was an ogre, like he was really mean. It was his way of teaching uh, in a way where you, I remembered ever. It's not, I can, in my mind, I can nearly go right back then. I see the place. I see him. He made it very vivid where I would remember it. And you know what? It was hands-on. He could sit and explain it to me till the cows come home. But until I took that torch and I took that solder and got heat on it and started doing that, then I know how to do it. And that's essentially what we all do. We can hear all the doctrine in the world. We have it in our notes. We can tell other people. But until we do it, we really don't know what we're talking about. A surgeon has to use the scalpel for the first time, hands-on. The lawyer must argue a case in court for the first time. A pastor has to get behind the pulpit for the first time. A soldier has to go into combat for the first time. Now, they can be trained. They can have just... Years of training. And they can have all the books you can possibly read about how to do these things. But until you're doing it, until it's hands-on, you really don't know other than just theoretical concepts. It's when you have hands-on and you are doing it, that's when you learn. A believer has to witness to someone for the first time. Or he tries to explain a new concept, principle, or doctrine he has learned for the first time. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. Can, can any of you remember when you gave the gospel for the first time? I can't. But I know for sure that I was shaky. I was frightened. I was afraid I was going to do it the wrong way, and they're going to ask me something that... I didn't know the answer to, and I would be embarrassed, and I would ruin the whole thing. I just want to throw my hands up and run away. That's what I envisioned. But at least I had the sense before I witnessed that this person was praying. And I asked for prayer. 
that God would help me not be a colossal failure or mess anything up. And he answered that prayer. I was calm, cool, and collected. I don't remember what all I said. But he was showing me his faithfulness right then. And I did give the right gospel. I knew what the correct gospel was. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The people that now are giving all kinds of nonsense and don't even use the word believe, they may have finesse, but it doesn't mean a thing because they're giving a false gospel. So whenever we learn a doctrine and we want to give it to other people, that, sh that should be the first thing. When you learn something about God from His Word, I know it is this way with me, and I imagine it is with you, or at least it should be. I can't wait to go tell someone else. There's no way. You can imagine the first thing I do when I get home, I'm telling Carrie, guess what? And she does the same thing for me. It's exciting. We want to know all we can. But you have to take that first step. You have to not just have it up here. I guess you have to have it in here. You have to will to do it. It's not until we stand before someone and express something we thought we'd learned that we realize we don't know it as well as we thought we did. Doesn't everybody... Ex I, listen, I, came I used to go to Barack and I would go out to the website, uh, I mean, excuse me, to the job site. And I was, a, I was a foreman and then I was a superintendent. I had friends that I, they, they knew I went to Baraka and I would talk, them, talk to them about spiritual matters. This is on a job site. These are tobacco chewing, cussing uh, guys, tough. Listen, they're interested. All you have to do is start the conversation and they are like a sponge. And so I would go out and explain things to them and more than one time, in fact, a lot of times, I would say, guess what I learned at church last night? What? Well, it wasn't there. And when it was being taught, I followed it. I had the concepts in my mind when I went to explain them. That's real time. That's experience in doing it. I fell flat. And I said, you know what? I don't know it as good as I. You'll have to wait another few days. And I would, I'd come back and I would give it another shot. So that happens. If you really know, want to know how well you know something, try to teach it or explain it to someone else and you'll know exactly how well you know it. Someone may know everything there is to know about faith rest, but until he actually trusts the Lord in a crucially dire situation, they will be defeated by fear and worry and will not experience the phenomenal faithfulness of God. You could wax eloquent and tell all your friends and tell everybody how great faith rest is because you've heard it. You've got it right out of the Bible. It's in your soul. It's great. But if you don't apply that doctrine, if you don't pull the trigger on that, it doesn't mean a thing. But when you do, when you're in a situation, it's a crisis, and you say, oh God, I need help. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm going to trust you because I'm asking that you're going to take care of this situation for me. You're going to help me to get through it without being panicky. And when you see things then develop and just fall apart, because you ask. <clears throat> That's what you're doing there is applying doctrine to your circumstances. That's what we're talking about. And all of you should know what I'm talking about because as time develops and it's never as <clears throat> excuse me, it's never as bad as I had thought. I mean I already had visions. I can play uh, videos in my head trying to go to sleep of the horrible things how this is going to go. That's not faith rest, is it? But I, got to, I could tell you anything you want to know about faith rest, but there it was, worried and just traumatized. It takes the, at least the first time to say, in this one, I'm going to trust the Lord. I don't care what happens, 
He says that he's going to give me peace. Well, we'll see. And when that happens, you are so happy. You want to glorify him. You want to go tell everybody about how great your God is. But you have to pull the trigger. It's in real time. You just can't have it up in here. Romans 4.21. Okay. Romans 4.21. And being fully assured that what he had promised, that is what God had promised Abraham, and what is it that he promised? That he was going to have an heir. Even though it was physically impossible, he promised him that he was going to have an heir. And after all this time and the tribulations and the mistakes and the woes and everything that happened between God and Abraham, over that period of time, slowly, incrementally, Abraham's faith was strengthened. Then it was time for him to tell others how great his God was, that he was strong in faith. It didn't happen overnight, but it happened. So, and being fully assured that what he, God, had promised, he was able to perform. That's what faith is, believing that God can do what he says he can do and will do. Abraham understood that the strength of faith was not in himself, but in the Lord. Trusting in ourselves apart from the Lord is foolish because we know of the many times we have failed ourselves as well as others, but it is impossible for God to fail. Now God says that when you go to him and you talk to him, you pray, and you are humble and you're asking for his help, his strength, his power. It is impossible for him to say, Go away, you're bothering me. That will never happen. But people aren't doing it. Believers, they go on with their same mode all the time trying to handle it themselves and leaving God completely out of it. Yes. Wait a minute. Is this on? I was working in the plants and I had a similar situation happen to me where uh, the Lord was leading me to uh, witness to this man at work and I was terrified. Um, I was afraid if I don't have all the answers, what am I going to say? The same things you're talking about. Well, the Lord was just telling me, just, just say something. Get the conversation started. So that's the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. So as we, we all clocked in every day, we had this whole big gathered area to where everybody would kind of push in and go through the gate. And this man showed up and, you know, Lord was, was saying, go tell him, go tell him. And I was holding back. I can't go up there and talk to him with all these people around, you know. And so Lord just kept telling me, just go open the door, just start talking. And I kind of, Moved up next to the man. I finally made my conversation known to him. I started saying, you know, I was a believer in Jesus Christ, and I wanted to tell him about the Lord. And from behind me, another man says, well, I'm a believer too. And then another one from another area says, I am too. And they all congregated around me. Next thing you know, the majority of the crowd that was there were believers, and they were all witnessing to the man. But it wasn't about what I was able to do and whether I was going to have the knowledge because God's word was going to go through regardless whether I was able to follow through. All I needed to do was start the conversation. Yeah. That's a, <clears throat> excuse me. That, you said something that's important. I'm going to expand on it a little bit. What Scott was expressing was that whether he was going to give the gospel or not, that man was going to get the gospel. But he had the joy and the honor of representing Jesus Christ and the gospel to him. So you were blessed. And the people that let fear destroy their initiative to talk to people about whether it's a new doctrine or the gospel, whatever it is, 
doesn't mean that that person will never hear it, but you won't have the high honor as being a good ambassador to, ambassador to the Lord and get the joy that goes along with that. If you've never witnessed to someone and had them accept the gospel, you don't know joy. You don't know that kind of joy. It's, it's just like you're... Uh, I, I use the, the phrase cloud nine, but that doesn't resonate with people probably anymore. You, you feel like you're just floating across the air. It's so wonderful. And so the whole point is that if you're going to be successful in God using the training and the trials to bring you up to this point to where your faith is strengthened, you have to fight the flesh to do it. Your flesh, just like Scott was, oh no, don't, you're going to be embarrassed. Look, there's people around. They're going to be laughing. You're going to make a fool out of yourself. In one ear, that's all you hear. But you have to fight through that and say, it doesn't matter. I'm commanded to do this. The Lord is, help, is going to help me because I ask Him. And then with your heart that's about to beat out of your mouth, you go up there and you start talking to someone and you will never, ever regret that. Genesis chapter 18, verse 13 through 14. Genesis 18, verse 13 through 14. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? This is the issue I was talking about earlier. When the Lord came with two angels and he told Abraham this out there and Sarah was listening and she laughed. Verse 14. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? I'm tempted to have you go to that verse and underline it, but I, I don't have time. You need to... And blazing that on your soul, the question is anything too difficult for the Lord? And of course, we know the answer to that, no. And he says, at the point in time, I will return to you, and at this time next year, Sarah shall have a son. Do you see, excuse me, the grace in that? She laughed. And God said, next year, at this time, you'll have a son. That's not only grace. Think of the patience that he had with her and Abraham. Think of the grace he extended to them. But he wasn't doing it because of her. He was doing it because he said he would do it. And he is infinitely faithful to his word. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23 through 25. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. The Lord knows what's in store for us. We have no idea what it's going to be like a month, a, a, a six months, a year from now. Maybe it might be a day or a week. Things are changing and not for the good. Boy, is this a strong verse for us. Mark 10, verse 27. For all things are possible with God. Abraham found that out. He laughed and Sarah laughed the first time they heard it. But God in his grace and his patience brought them along. Trial here, trial here hardship here, and through every one of those, he brought them through it. Not because of anything that they did, but because of his love and because of his faithfulness to them. And they finally caught on. 
And they recognize that God's faithfulness never fails. The more we mature spiritually, the more confidence we have in the Lord. And the more confident we are, the stronger our faith will be. Why do we come to Bible class time after time after time? Why do we do it? Because we're maturing spiritually. We're learning more and more about what God expects from us. About His grace. About His love. About His mercy. But also His righteousness and justice. We're learning all these things. And when we go out into the world and we want to witness, or we want to talk about the Lord, maybe about some new doctrine or whatever, the old sin nature is still going to fight you. But I'll tell you this, the more that you push forward, and you witness to people, or you're talking about the Lord to them, or about a doctrine or whatever it is, it gets easier and easier. In fact, it gets to the point where you're looking forward to it. But if you haven't been doing it and you haven't built up any experience in it, it can be scary. But we're required to do it, and God goes before us, just like He went before the Israelites in the land of Canaan. We don't go into spiritual battle ever alone. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, God is with us. And you'll be surprised. You, 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 you might be afraid to talk to somebody, afraid that they're going to belittle you or something, and you start talking to them. And if you are a student of the Word of God, that you follow these doctrines in your way, in your mind, in your soul, in your brain, and you start talking to them, things are coming out of your mouth like this. And wow, where did that come from? The Holy Spirit's taking what you have, and He's giving it out to these people at the time that they need to hear it and if you haven't done that boy you're just missing out so the more we mature spiritually the more confidence we have in the Lord what is confidence? it's pistis it's hope it's confident expectation and the more confident we are the stronger our faith will be I'm going to end here but when we start Thursday on Romans 4.22, therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness. We're going to take a radical turn. The subject matter is going to change, and I'm going to teach something here that I haven't taught before. It's not what it looks like. And so we'll go over that Thursday night. Is everybody on board? Everybody, anybody here have any questions before we close? I, I, when I saw that I had not followed the, the uh, truth of the Word of God when I was young, uh, not that you were rebellious and anything else, but you did not see it was a free gift. Thought you had to add works, and uh, they found the truth through our first pastor who gave us the truth, and then we referred us to Bob Theme. And I was we were in deep study under Bob Theme, and Dot's daddy was an unbeliever in his seventies, and her his sister was in the not far behind, I don't think, or maybe older, was she? No, uh, Pauline. Pauline, and, and uh, I had a, I developed a burden for those two people, and then I'd get around them, I'd get so nervous, and I'm sure I'd be fidgety, but I had to get that over to them, and uh, it was one of the most difficult things to ever break that barrier, mm -hmm. where you'd say, I don't care if they're going to laugh at me or what, I'm going to do it. And Dot's daddy was in his 70s, and he'd cry. We'd be hunting, and he'd cry, and he wasn't no soft man. He would cry and say, 
It must be something to that. Ever too many people believe it. I say, yeah, but it don't apply to you unless you believe it. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with his sister. She was dying of cancer. So in my early days, before I was 25 years old, I got to break in real good. I wish I could still do it that easy. Well, it was the right place at the right time, the right people. That's what God does. He uses us. And we, can't, we, we think in our mind, well, somebody else can do it. Well, do you want someone else to get the blessing? I mean, <clears throat> sure, God is going to get the gospel to someone that is elect because he knew in eternity past that they were going to believe the gospel. They can use, he can use someone else. But you're the one that misses out. You know, we need to be audacious, bold in giving the gospel and talking about the Bible and talking about how great our God is. You don't see that much anymore. And here we are believers that are the cream of the crop when it comes to theological, systematic theology, and we're still timid? And the hour is late and the need is so drastic? We have to fight those doubts and those the old sin nature trying to say, no, you, you just need to stay put. You don't need to be doing that. We have to forge right past that. And once you do it, the next time it's easier, and it gets easier and easier as time goes by. But how many believers, countless believers, that probably has never even given the gospel even one time because they were defeated listening to their old sin nature. So, well, let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word and what it does to us. It invigorates us. It smashes us and builds us back again and gives us hope. We're so thankful for it. We're thankful for our Lord Jesus Christ and your plan for each one of us. Even though there are dark times ahead, we don't have to have foreboding or dread. The darker it gets, the darker it gets, the lighter we can shine. We need hope. We need, need that confidence. And we need to pull the trigger on the doctrines that we know and let the Holy Spirit lead us where we need to be and be bold and audacious about telling others how great our God is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.